In this video, we're going to give you the eight steps to follow to convert a use case to a robustness diagram. At the end of it all, you'll be ready to see how a use case and a robustness diagram can finally set you up for constructing your first round sequence diagram and class diagrams. So, last time we talked about robustness diagrams, we indicated that they occupy a specific niche in the early development stages of a software project. We further pointed out that unlike the other 14 diagrams, robustness diagrams are a semi-formal part of the process and they focus on the interaction of different system parts with respect to a specific use case. Now, I do seem to recall reading somewhere that when UML first came out, its authors and advocates were already worried that there might be too many diagram types so as to frighten away users. So in the end, they decided that the robustness diagram would not be one formally placed in with the other 14. I think it's too bad because, as we will see, the lack of emphasis on robustness diagrams in the UML system really does explain why it feels like there's such a conceptual gap when moving from use cases to their corresponding initial system sequence diagram. So what I want to do on this video is look at how the dynamic analysis is captured by robustness diagrams and how these can indeed close the design and analysis gap. Recall from the last video that robustness diagrams consist of three basic components, boundary objects, entity objects, and control objects, which together provide a visual representation of system interfaces, data storage, and business logic respectively. Moving from a software use case to a UML robustness diagram involves several key steps. These steps help in translating the functional requirements captured in use cases into a visual representation that bridges the gap between business requirements and the technical design of the system. This is especially useful in the early stages of software design. Briefly, here they are in overview. Identify use cases. Select a specific use case. List down actors. Identify boundary, entity, and control objects. Create an initial sketch of the diagram. Map out the interactions. Iterate as needed. Integrate with other UML diagrams. Now then, let's walk through these in detail. Here's the first three. Now, yes, I know you can read, but let's get everything down up front, maybe with a bit of detail added, so you'll know what you're looking at as we build our robustness diagrams. Number one, identify use cases. Start by clearly defining and understand the use cases for your software. Now, just as a review, a use case describes a system's behavior under various conditions as it responds to a request from one of the stakeholders. Here we start with a very simple set of four use cases and one user. When thinking about use cases, it's always best just to pick out a few of the key ones and not try to see everything at once. Number two, select a specific use case for diagramming. Choose one use case that you want to represent in the robustness diagram. It's important to focus on one use case at a time. Now, why is this? because you want to keep your diagrams clear and manageable. And if you have a huge use case, probably best to break it up into smaller ones so that your diagrams are controllable. Number three, list down actors and use case scenarios. Identify all the actors, users, or external systems involved in the use case. Also, break down the use case into individual scenarios or main success scenarios. This includes the sequence of steps that an actor and the system will take to accomplish the goal of the use case. We'll show an example of this in a minute. Number four, identify boundary, entity, and control objects. Now we've seen these earlier. Let's review them with a bit more detail than what we said. Boundary objects. These are the system's interfaces with the actors, like user interfaces, for example, screens or forms, or really any interfaces to external systems. 
entity objects. These represent the system's data and are often linked to the database or data models. For example, customer records or product details or any kind of data or file information that you would pull from somewhere. And of course, control objects. These are responsible for performing the business logic or calculations. They control the flow of data between boundary and entity objects. And point five, create initial sketch of the diagram. Draw the identified objects, boundary, entity, control objects, and arrange them according to their interactions in the use case scenario. Use arrows to show flow of interaction. We'll show this in a moment. Okay, here's the last three. Number six, map out the interactions. Detail how the actors interact with the boundary objects, how boundary objects interact with control objects, and how control objects manipulate entity objects. This mapping should follow the sequences of steps identified in the use case scenario. Again, remember, this is a transition diagram that moves between your use cases and some of your more advanced UML cases like sequence diagrams and class diagrams. So it will share a little bit of properties with both. Yes, I know you're waiting for an example. You get to wait a couple more minutes. Number seven, iterate as needed. Review the diagram to ensure that it actually represents the use case and includes all necessary interactions. Check for logical consistency and completeness. As you get more information or as requirements change, update the robustness diagram to reflect these changes. What you're doing is you're looking at all the different permutations that run through your use case. You know, it's great if things go well, but sometimes there are alternates or extensions and options you have to consider, and you can trace through those by having a good robustness diagram. Okay, finally, number eight, integrate with other UML diagrams. Once the robustness diagram is complete, it can be used to inform the creation of more detailed UML diagrams like your lovely sequence diagrams or class diagrams, which will further refine the technical design. All right, now it's example time. Let's pull out the third use case here, which we've called checkout. As you can see, it's in what's called brief format. There are not pre or post conditions, just a very basic course of what it takes the user to do a checkout. From this use case, we identify noun phrases that can be boundary objects for system interfaces, verbs that can be control objects, and other noun phrases that can be entity objects where data is stored long term. Now, there are rules for what components can talk to what components. Here are the four basic rules. One, actors can only talk to boundary objects. Two, boundary objects can only talk to controllers and actors. Three, entity objects can talk only to controllers. And four, controllers can talk to boundary objects and entity objects and to other controllers, but not to actors. Now, at this time, you're probably wondering, what are these controllers? Because you kind of know what a screen is. You kind of know what a database or a file system is. Well, the controllers, just to give you a little foreshadowing here, they're going to become the functions and methods and otherwise controlling things within your programs. But we're not going to get to that just right now. Interestingly enough, you don't have to search around the Internet long before you find this robustness diagram. It's supposed to be a paradigm example. Turns out it's somewhat confusing, and there's a mixture of interface elements with behavior elements, and it's not exactly structured for easy understanding of flow. Some places it has arrows, some don't. Some are not connected by lines, some are. There's even two controllers that say the same thing. Let's improve this by iterating on both the use case itself and the robustness diagram itself. All right, here we've given structure to the use case and moved things around with the robustness diagram to capture a more uh, understandable flow. We've even added numbers to our behavior components, so there's no doubt what component goes with which step of our use case. Now it's very clear what step in the use case corresponds to what part of the robustness diagram. And that's really what you want as you add a bit more complexity to robustness diagrams. I've heard it said you want about five to no more than 10 units and certainly no more than 15. I think that's right after using them quite a bit because things get very complicated very quickly and it becomes overwhelming as you transition into the more 
uh, let us say, analytically structured class diagrams and sequence diagrams. Keep them small, keep them with a few units, and you'll thank yourself later. So where does this all go? Well, eventually you will integrate your robustness diagram into a system sequence diagram. But that's a lesson for another day.